Hi guys, so today I'm going to be presenting my research paper topic. Um, my topic was related to attachment with the mother, um, mother parenting kind of style. So the research paper that I chose was titled Maternal Reflective Functioning Among Mothers with Childhood Maltreatment Histories and the Links to Sensitive Parenting and Infant Attachment Security. Um, that's it's a long title, so I'll get into it a little bit about um, what kind of all of that means. So the first thing I wanted to explain is reflective functioning. Um, reflective functioning refers to a parent's capacity to reflect upon their own and their child's mental states. So thoughts, feelings, desires that the mother has, also what the child has, and kind of relate both of them and then link them to their own or child's behavior. It allows the parents to anticipate and respond in a sensitive and appropriate manner to their child's cues. So a mother with a low RF, reflective functioning, it means that the mom is unaware of their own or their child's thoughts or feelings and denies any emotional experiences associated with parenting. Um, so a mother that's like not as attached as some would say. Um, a mother with high RF is aware of their emotions as well as others like their children and they're able to understand how their mental states impact their own and others' behaviors and understand the complexities of the mental states. And reflective functioning is usually stable over time, but sometimes through interventions it can be altered. So a little bit of a review of the literature prior to the study. There have been many studies in various populations um, about kind of the relationship of these two things, including women with mental illness or substance abuse. Um, but the research has been limited to small sample sizes and men, there's been few studies that have explicit, explicitly tested associations among several re risk factors such as demographic, psychosocial, and RF. So a lot of them kind of would just do one risk factor. This one's going to be doing multiple risk factors. So risk, parenting, and attachment. Um, I'm kind of just going to break down the relationship between all three of these things. So any demographic risk factors such as single parenting, insufficient financial capital, um, are linked to poor parenting, um, children behavior outcomes would be more maladaptive, more, there's more of an increase, increased risk for maternal trauma, which is associated with PTSD and depression. Um, as the risk increases, so the more risk factors that the mother has, the likelihood that the infant or children will develop a disorganized attachment also increases. A woman's exposure to maltreatment in childhood is linked to difficulties regulating their emotions, impaired perspective taking, adult psychopathology, and compromised parenting. So the relevance of this study is that it is a longitudinal study to examine the effects of maltreatment history of the mothers on their parenting style. So if a mother has experienced any maltreatment as a child, does it affect the outcome of their own children or how they parent their child? Um, it also further examines the relationship between demographic, psychosocial risks, parenting, RF, and infant attachment. So there are two aims of the study. The first aim is to confirm that there is a relationship between RF, parenting, and attachment. Um, and they also want to further evaluate whether the psychosocial and demographic risks are associated with that relationship between RF, parenting, and attachment. The second aim of the study evaluated whether the parenting sensitivity and negativity were significant mediators of the association between RF and infant attachment security. So I'm going to break those terms down a little bit because that one was very confusing to me, so I'm going to break those terms down um, in a couple slides. So for the sample characteristics, there were 83 mother-child dyads. Um, the income ranged from less than $29,000 annually to more than $95,000 annually. Their, their sample was ethnic, ethnically diverse, and more than half of the parents were, more than half of the mothers were college graduates, and most of the mothers were either married or living with the child's birth father. So some methods of the study, it was based on a larger study called the Macy. It is the Maternal Anxiety in the Child Bearing Years Project. So the 83 mother 
mother-child dyads were pulled from that large study. Um, and then this study was focused on the data collection of the Macy study at the 7 and 16 month visit. So at the 7 month visit, there was, this is kind of the metric that they had. Um, so at the 7 month visit, they had a 4 point cumulative demographic risk variable. So what that means is they were kind of measuring how much risk they have um, with their demographics. So it was, a, like I said, it was a 4 point, so 1 point per each um, risk. And the four risks they were measuring for was if the mother was a single parent, if they um, were a mother at a young age, they're saying less than 21, um, if they have a low education, which they say is less than high school diploma or a GED, and if their annual income is less than $20,000 a year. Also during the seven month visit, they had a childhood trauma questionnaire. Um, it was a self-report, it was 28 items, and it had the mother report on any, um, like I said, trauma they experienced, so emotional, physical, or sexual abuse, or any neglect, whether that be physical or emotional. Um, and they also included a three-item minimization slash denial scale, which um, I think is a really good part of this questionnaire because it was a self-report that they might not be completely honest or want to kind of acknowledge that they did have some trauma in their childhood, so that three-item scale was included in that measure. At the 16th month visit, they measured, they had two, two scales that measured for depression and, and PTSD. Um, the depression one was a postpartum depression screening scale. It was 35 items, and it basically just measured the sim, uh, uh, with the symptomology of depression. And then the one for PTSD was the National Women's Study PTSD model. Um, it was a phone interview, and it just measured the symptomology of PTSD. They also had a videotaped session of the, in, of the interaction between the mother and the infant. There was seven minutes of a free play session and a three minute cleanup session. And it was evaluated on a five point Likert scale from the parent coding system of the Macy study, so the larger study. The scales included behavioral sensitivity, affective sensitivity, negativity, over controlling slash intrusiveness, and we'll break those down. So parenting sensitivity. Um, so there's two little categories on, underneath parenting sensitivity. So behavioral sensitivity is the mother's awareness or ability to perceive and respond to subtle cues from, from the infant um, from their behavior. So a mother with low BS makes no or little attempts to follow the child's lead, not aware of the cues of the child, and just withdrawn or emotionally unavailable. Um, a mother with high BS almost always responds to the child's cues in a timely and respectful manner. Um, so what I was kind of thinking when I kind of was trying to make an example for this one is during like like during play, if a child goes over to like the toy box and grabs like a whole like a whole different set of toys like a puzzle or something and then brings it back. Um, the parent be like, oh, okay, they want to do a puzzle now, or like kind of re if the child redirects themselves, is the mother able to kind of recognize that and follow the lead? Affective sensitivity is the same exact thing, but it's more on the affect of the kid. Is the mother able to kind of be sensitive to how the the affect of the kid, how they're, you know, um, if they're able to recognize the child's affect and respond to the cues from it and readjust. So a mother with low AS affective sensitivity, they do not reflect or mirror the child's affective experience. A mother with high AS is consistent in, with understanding or empathy for her child's internal experience. So parenting negativity also has two terms underneath it. So maternal negativity is the degree to which the mother expresses negativity or hostility to the child or scolds, restricts, or prohibits the child during play. So a mother with low MS shows no or brief mild episodes of negativity towards their child, and a high maternal negativity shows marked or persistent indicators of negativity towards their child. The overcoming slash intrusiveness scale is the extent to which the mother redirects or overrides the child when the child is focused on an, act an activity. 
Um, so say a child is over playing with a different toy, does the mother go over there and kind of disrupt the kid, um, even though they're doing just fine playing with that toy, um, just kind of being like over controlling or intrusive in ways that is not really necessary or could be inappropriate. Reflective functioning was measured with a parent developmental interview. It was during the 16 month visit. Um, it was a 30 item scale and assessed the parent's ability to reflect on their own and child's thoughts, feelings, beliefs, desires, and intentions. And they were scored on an 11 point scale. So we kind of already talked about what a, a high RF and low RF is. So I'll kind of over it again because there's a lot of terms in this study that can get very confusing. A mother with high RF is the awareness of mental states, explicitly attempting to tease out mental states and underlying behavior, recognizing developmental aspects of mental states, and mental states in relationship to interviewer, which I thought was interesting. Low RF is the lack of ability to acknowledge and discuss mental states in oneself or child. So just maybe not having like the verbiage to even kind of explain like how they're feeling or um, their beliefs, desires, thoughts, like they can't speak for themselves or for their child. That's what a mother with low RF would have. So for infant attachment, they evaluated videotapes of the infant behavior during the, they did the strange situation during the 16th month visit. There were, um, eight successive episodes that were designed to exert on increasing level of mild stress on the child other child dyad um and then this the evaluation of the videotapes was like i said trying to measure the attachment of the mother child dyad um and of course they scored it on secure insecure slash ambivalent slash disorganized or disoriented attachment which we have went over all those kind of attachment styles in class so that that's kind of what they measured the attachment on from the videotape sessions of the strange situation in the 16th month visit. So there were two hypothesis, hypotheses for the study. The first hypothesis was a parent with higher reflector, reflective functioning would relate to higher levels of sensitivity, lower levels of negativity, and there would be a secure attachment at 16th month postpartum. Um, they also said a mother with lower demographic or psychosocial risk status, so lower um, risk factors that'd be associated with higher RF, higher sensitivity, and lower negativity, and secure attachment. So they're saying like um, higher RF, lower risk factors would all be associated with lower parenting negativity, higher parenting sensitivity, and secure attachment. And they believe that RF parenting and attachment security will all be intercorrelated um, in the results. I know it's like a little bit confusing, um, but the results will kind of help explain a little bit more of these terms. It can, it can be a little bit confusing. For the second hypothesis, they hypothesize that a mother with higher RF would be associated with secure attachment also would be associated with higher parenting sensitivity and then a mother with low rf would be associated with insecure attachment and higher negativity so to me a lot of these hypotheses are like kind of similar in the sense that higher rf of the parent would be better like would lead to more attachment um less negativity higher sensitivity it kind of that's kind of what they're all kind of saying, just using a lot of the terms that we already discussed. So now let's go into the results. So the results for the demographics, there were, so 38% of the mothers reported they had experienced severe maltreatment as a child. About 70% of the mothers reported they experienced a form of maltreatment as a child. So that's a big percentage of the 83 um, mothers. Six, about 70% of them have experienced some maltreatment. Um, 38 was about se was with severe maltreatment. 13% um, of the mothers met criteria for PTSD. 24 met criteria for depression. And I wanted to note, which I thought was interesting, that the 
PTSD and depression results are higher than the general population. So, um, so the the um, sample size of the mothers, the rates of their depression and PTSD are higher than the the general population, which I thought was interesting. Um, and then they said that mothers with a history of maltreatment are more likely to be diagnosed with PTSD or depression compared to mothers who have not experienced maltreatment, which I think is um, common sense at this point. So some of the results of the measures, I'll go through these a little bit slowly because like I said, their terms can be confusing. Um, reflective functioning was associated with higher sensitivity and lower negativity. Um, so basically, a uh, parent that had a high RF was more sensitive to the child's needs, um, to their behaviors, to their emotions, and weren't as negative to their child. Um, parents were more demographic risk, so a lot of risk factors. Um, were significant with, with higher negativity. So they're saying if a mother was um, experienced trauma or a single parent or a uh, low annual income, they had higher rate, ratings of negative parenting. So they were more negative to their child. Um, that's kind of what that result was saying. So I started these last two results because I thought they were the most interesting and kind of unexpected, which is, I, which is really interesting, like I said. Um, mothers with a higher level of RF, reflective functioning, endorse more depressive symptoms, which I thought was very interesting. Um, also, RF, parenting, and child attachment, which they all thought were associated, um, so RF, parenting, and child attachment were not associated with a history of maltreatment or depression slash PTSD symptoms. So they're saying that even though there was a history of maltreatment or depression or depression slash PTSD symptoms, it does not, they're not correlated with the three main factors of RF, attachment, and um, parenting, which I thought was interesting. Result of the parenting, the children classified as secure had mothers with high RF compared to infants classified as avoidant or disorganized. So basically they're saying infants that had a sec more secure attachment had p mothers who had higher RF compared to infants who had a avoidant or disorganized attachment, RF scores were lower, which I think is pretty um, self-explanatory and kind of expected, I would think. Um, parenting was associated with attachment. Um, Secure attachment, parents are more sensitive and not as negative. A disorganized attachment, parents were less sensitive and more negative. So some strengths and limitations of this study. Um, so some strengths, I think the findings are relevant for developing parenting prevention interventions programs. Because um, even though they a mother may have some maltreatment or some risk factors doesn't mean that their parenting is going to be doomed or the child can have all these behavioral problems so that's kind of relevant to kind of um help mothers that do have this kind of risky background and help them be a better parent um the sample includes women from a range of socioeconomic backgrounds um, multiple measures assessing childhood maltreatment histories and postpartum psychopathology and it also added to the existing literature and other studies of this topic. Um, some limitations, they only had one kind of factor measuring RF, um, which was kind of like one of the main points. So there's only one that was measuring that. Um, the sample wasn't as like, I guess didn't reflect like the general population. Like I said, there was more depressed, like more mothers that qualified, not qualified. There were more mothers that um, had depression, depressive and PTSD symptoms compared to the general population. Um, and they said, for another limitation, they said that there could be other characteristics of the mother and infant that may impact or influence RF or parenting. So they said they could have measured IQ, maternal language skills, educational attainment, um, even though they already had a lot of factors that they were kind of measuring. So uh, this next slide is a little part of the article that we had to read for 
the class I was going to put that at, which was by, I don't know how to say his name, um, Sassetti and Doyle. So this quote right here is actually really interesting and goes really well with this whole study. It says, the fact that not all maltreated children do so lends hope to potentially bleak scenario and also speaks to the potential benefit of theoretical grounded approaches for the prevention of maltreatment as well as for the treatment of those who have been experiencing caregiving trauma. So to kind of explain that a little bit better, um, like I kind of said in the, a little bit earlier is that if a mother has experienced any trauma or any maltreatment or any other risk factors does not mean they're going to be a bad parent. Um, does not mean their child, they're going to have a poor attachment style with their kid. Um, so it's, even though we, the uh, uh, public may assume like, oh, there's all these risk factors against this mother, they're going to be a horrible parent, or their child's going to have all these behavioral problems. It's not true um, from this study. So they're saying like, it gives us kind of like hope that if there are a lot of risk factors or stuff piled up against the mom and that there is hope and that we can use all these prevention programs to kind of um, assist the mother in learning all these parenting skills that can better benefit her and her child's relationship. So I have five discussion questions here. I guess I'll just read through them. Um, the first one is, why do you think mothers with a high RF endorsed more depressive symptoms? I thought that was like the most interesting result and it does make me think about it a little bit. So I just want to hear you guys' thoughts on like why you think they have more depressive symptoms. Um, what are some protective factors of the mothers who have experienced childhood maltreatment? So like I said, just because mothers have experienced some maltreatment doesn't mean that they're going to be a bad parent. So what are some of the protective factors that they might have to not um, have their maltreatment like completely affect their parenting style? Um, any other limitations you guys think of for this study? Um, is there any other factors that you think that should have been added for this study? I know this is like IQ, um, the language, or an educational attainment. Is there any other factors that you guys think that should have been um, included in the study? I think they did a lot. They measured like a lot of different kinds of aspects of the mother, but I'm sure there's always more. Um, and then, like I said, there was only one measure that measured RF. So what other measure could we include to measure RF on the mothers. And then those are my references. Okay, thank you guys.